Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. I've been saying hello, Ben. Hello, hello. Wonderful. Can you all hear me okay? Good morning, Sia. Good morning, Celeste. Good morning, Trish. Uh, hi, Feline. Hi, your head. Hello, everyone. I think let's get started. We've got about 73 people on this floor in this session. Um, I think we can expect to hear more and more uh, people joining us as we go along. But let me just start by saying a, a great good morning to you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Marius. Thank you for that feedback, Viv. Thank you. I see that you hear me loud and clear. Zander Lee, good morning. Good morning, Ian van Jaarsveld. Hello, 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 everyone. And also, good morning to everyone that greeted in the chat uh, this morning. This platform is called Remo. It's a very simple, very engaging, very interactive platform. And uh, I'm going to be your host for the next few hours. And um, I think it's an hour and a half. So good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at our very first Nexus event of the year. I'm Tracy Lee, Tracy Lee Miller, and I'm the brand and marketing executive at Private Property. I'm going to be your MC, your virtual host for this morning. I suggest you go get yourself a cup of coffee, cup of tea, a bottle of water. Of course, the word Nexus means a series of connections that link two or more things together. And that is what these private property Nexus events are really about. It's a series of digital networking events that cultivates people connection through knowledge sharing and networking. Our first Nexus was hosted last year in November. Were you there? Did you, did you attend that Nexus? Morning, Claudia. Good morning, Endri. Good morning, Maria, I see you. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Leanne from Plettenberg Bay. And then our studio as well said good morning. Hi, Venusha. Jelly Kina, this is your first Nexus event. Well, guess what? This is our first Nexus event for 2021. And um, last year's event was so well received, we decided to bring it back this year, but to do it a little bit differently. So for this particular Nexus event, we have literally gone and tailored specific events to specific regions so that the insights that we are about to share and that we are about to listen to are relevant to you in your area, giving you the best possible chance of achieving success in this market. It's still quite a tough market. We've got a great lineup for you today. And before we get started, I'm just going to point a couple of things out for you so that you can be able to engage. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Deborah. So that you can be able to engage with us. This platform is incredibly engaging. So on your left, you'll see there's a chat box where everyone is saying good morning, good morning, Tando. The very next tab is the participants tab. And in this tab, you can literally connect with any person by just clicking and sending them a message, a message or, you know, finding out more about them. The very last tab on the left hand column here is the Q&A tab. So I'm going to ask a question. What is your favorite color? And if you think that this question is a good enough question to have your name to it, or if it's a question where, you know, you know, it's a little bit tricky, the, the response might not be um, what, what you want everyone to, to hear, then you can ask the question anonymously. But I'm going to ask this question and I'm going to have my name in it. And there you can see in that Q&A box, you now have Tracy Lee asking, what is your favorite color? And if anyone else in the room thinks that this is a good enough question for all of us to hear the answer to, you can vote it up. So somebody's already upvoted that question. You can upvote it again, upvote it again. And then when the person who's presented their session, they then will then ask them to answer that question for you. But in the meantime, this chat facility here, blue, Okay, okay, purple, blue, silver, Andrew, blue, I love it. And now your favorite color is silver. Can I tell you what my favorite color is? Green. You guessed it. It's actually green. <laughs> 
Okay, okay. So I think you guys actually you've got the hang of it. Yeah, my favorite color is green too, Philly, and I'm a little bit biased when it comes to to that. Goeiemorgen, 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 goeiemorgen allemaal. Navy from Berenice. I see we have another question here. Stefan, you actually, you gave us the answer. <laughs> okay, let's give it a couple more minutes. Let me also just share with you what our agenda looks like. Um, and before we get to the agenda, if, if you are the most engaged person, you ask the most questions, you send the most uh, emojis, we know that you're in the room and you're participating, you're creating that energy for the room, then there is a prize up for grabs. And then the final thing that I want to mention here is we also have a one and a half non-verifiable CBD points on offer from AISA. And if you want to qualify or get those points, please stick around until you get to the end of the session. And then Ben is going to put the, the link in there for you to register so that you can get your, your one and a half CBD points. Okay, we still have a few more minutes. I want to bring our our first speaker onto the stage. His name is Dion Van Sale, and he's the regional manager, Home Loans Cape Region. But before we do that, I'm going to give it a few more minutes. I think more and more people are, are joining us. Let me ask a few questions. Where are you watching from? I can see some people already volunteered that information. Thank you, Sharon. You're watching from... Cozy Corner, East London, George, East London, East London, fantastic. Are you watching by yourself? Are you watching with someone? There's a reason I'm asking that question. Grace, you're in the UK. Wow, this is brilliant. You see, the, the, the beauty about these sessions is that you can watch from wherever in the world. If you've got an interest in a particular region, we're going to be hosting these sessions over the next four days, and I'm literally going to be your host for the next four days. Aliwal North, Endry, you're in Mossel Bay, Jeffreys Bay, somebody from Bloemfontein Tando. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And then we also have PE George, East London, uh, Plettenberg Bay, welcome everyone, welcome, welcome. Jalkina, you're all by yourself. Are you watching maybe with, uh, wow, Kids Beach, East London, and hello Tando from Bloom, that's from Celeste over there. I think you guys are really starting to get the hang of this platform. The other really awesome thing to look out for is when we break and we have networking sessions, when you switch your camera on and your microphone on, then everyone in the room will it's almost like you're sitting at the table and you're now able to engage. Of course, not everyone has to switch on their cameras, but it just makes the engagement a lot more human and interactive. Venusha, you're joining us from sunny Durban. It's pretty sunny where I'm at as well. Um, okay, I think, uh, Dion, are you ready? I'm about to bring Dion on. There's Menlin as well from Pretoria. Wilderness, Maria, Emma, Kutsia, welcome, welcome. And uh, who else do we have? Celestia in George, Anita. Marilyn is saying hi to Anita. Yeah, Jelkina, this platform is super easy to, to use. Of course, we have, uh, we've been trying out various virtual ways to connect, and we feel like this platform is an incredibly easy platform and really does facilitate engagement. Hello, Dion. Hello, Tracy, how are you? Ike is brilliant, man. I'm brilliant. I'm amazing. I'm wonderful. I'm blessed. I'm really looking forward to your session. Your microphone is on mute at the moment. Let's just unmute you. And then I will mute myself, switch off my camera, and then it's over to you, Dion. Okay. Awesome. Enjoy. Tracy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really a, a, a privilege to join you now, but something very interesting in that color question you asked, to understand that you are green makes sense, but to understand that both you and Felina are green, something is wrong, something is wrong. We'll have to look at that again. Um, colleagues, thank you, thank you so much, and, and it's a great privilege for me to be here today. As, as Tracy said, my name is Bjorn van Sal from, from EPSA Home Loans. I'm heading up the Cape region, and more specifically, the, um, the, the um, Western Cape, and then also that includes Eastern and Southern Cape as well. 
I'm joining this morning from the beautiful capital of the Garden Route here in Jorts. Really enjoying it. I have nice ways of traveling here this morning. A bit of rain and really looking forward to have a great day. Um, to our strategic partners, private property guys, thank you so much for, for, for setting this up and, and hosting these, these, these events. I can assure you it's really a privilege to share some thoughts um, um, with, 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 with you guys around, around this. I think um, going through, through the presentation, you will also see that, that I'm going to use a lot of micro information in terms of what, is you, what has been happening here in, in, the, in our area, in the Southern and Eastern Cape. Although I will only refer to Eastern Cape, please bear in mind that that includes um, um, the, 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 the Southern Cape as well. Um, and I will be glad to answer any questions. Um, if anyone would like to stoop to ask a question um, at, at the end, more than, more than willing to, um, to do that. So if we can move on to, to the first slide. There we are. So the slide saying to us, don't panic, but let's, let's just take a step back. One year ago, the first COVID uh, cases in South Africa has already been not diagnosed. And wow, that we see a steep increase in the new cases. At that stage as well, government introduced lockdown measures that compared to the top 25 in the world. We were really beleaguered by a global pandemic that has not only um, infected our industry or our country, but obviously, as you guys know, um, the whole world. Economists at that stage uh, predicted a contraction of our economy by not least than 8.3%, which was absolutely devastating for us. And in June last year, we saw an Ipsos survey that indicated that 90% of South Africans felt that COVID-19 has impacted them and their families. 35% of South Africans had experienced a salary cut. 14% lost their jobs. And 6% have asked to take unpaid leaves. And we saw Armageddon coming. Lockdown level five was closer to home with us in the property market as well. We were basically put out of business for two months. And that required a lot of us to rethink what is important to us, and we also had to rethink the way we live, the way we earn a living, and the way we conduct our, our, our business. At that stage, it was a very, very gloomy view for us. Um, just moving on to slide, slide three. So just, just some statistical um, in, information on, on this is that Bearing in mind that, that we have basically lost two months of economic activity in, in 2020, what was the impact on the industry? We saw a decline in property sales. And we as a bank, we saw that in our application volumes, which were down on the first half of the year by 9% versus 2019. In the Eastern Cape, we were very lucky. We were only down 2%. And in the Western Cape, we were down 4% against 2019. However, in that numbers, there was, it was remarkable to see the agility of the property market. And I think that's why we all love this industry. Because when we bounce back in the second half of the year, and wow, didn't each and every one of us felt that. We saw the application volumes then grow by 36% in the second half of the year. In the Eastern Cape, then at the end of the year, we closed off 30% up on 2019, and in the Western Cape, we closed off 35%. So just regaining up on what we've lost in the first half. From a DEEZ perspective, we saw that the activities translate into registrations. And what we saw there is that, again, in the second half, on average, we registered 2.1 times more than what we did in the first half. In the Eastern Cape, we registered 1,620 units which is 1.9 times, and in the Western Cape, a whopping 2,189, which is 2.1 times more. And that take us right through to only the um, lagging in the Eastern Cape by 8% to 2019 and 11.1% in the Western Cape. So what we saw was actually a tail of two halves. 
a dramatic downturn in H1, where we saw the, the sales decline, and then an even more dramatic increase in the second half of the year. And interesting as well is that we didn't see a deterioration in the quality of those customers, because that's important for us as a bank. We actually saw good quality customers coming through the door, and that allowed us to keep our appetite where we, were, where we had it and to make sure that the business that we put on book is still quality business where we can offer clients uh, the type of loans that they need, the type of loans that they require, and that also supported the business from our perspective. So, so what did our customers say about home ownership? You know, in unpacking all these activities was very interesting because not one of the EPSA home loan regional nuances was the same. It was so unique. Not one region reacted on this the same as the other. And our business agility were really tested to the limits. In some instances, our decision horizons were literally weekly and in some instances, daily. But I think important is, what was our customers thinking? What went through their mind in terms of what is happening in the industry? So what we see here is the EPSA Homeowners Sentiment Index. And, and if you look at the, at the, at the Sentiment Index, uh, which is also known as the HSI, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a propriety index which tests customers' confidence in the property market. So as you can see at the end of the year, customer confidence was at the highest for the whole year, but not only for the year of 2020, actually since inception of this index in 2015. Overall, we saw a 9% increase in the sentiments towards buying, and that should be good news for all of us, and an increase of 4% towards selling of property. There are basically four main contributors to the confidence of the 4% in quarter four, which resulted in the overall confidence ending up, as you can rightly see there at the bottom, at 80%. On the demand side, we saw the ability of property to increase in value. And currently also the low interest cycle, which played a major role in, in, in helping the confidence on, on the demand side. Then on the supply side, obviously, we saw the resilient in-house prices and the renewed impetus by owners to invest in their own properties. That came to the fore very, very strong during 2020 as well. Also very interesting to note is that the inland provinces, the overall sentiment for the inland provinces actually increased by 4% in quarter three, and those for coastal provinces by 6%. So we see the sentiment towards property in the coastal regions coming back to where it was before and increasing a bit more than what we saw in the inland provinces. So let's have a look at, at, the, at the various or at the different regions that, that we actually, saw, that, that we actually um, see. So if you look at the, the three major metros, we can see that all regions showed an overall increase in sentiment. However, the biggest of 10% was in the Western Cape. And why? Um, we think it was part, 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 of, part of the issue that driven that was the semigration, where customers can now work from anywhere. And they want virtually, they can work from, from, from their homes. And, and, and choosing that lifestyle over convention in the city just made it so much easier for everybody to start doing business. Kauteng, however, remains the region with the higher sentiment. And we can also see that if we look at the number of applications for 2020, which was predominantly driven through our Gauteng region. The Eastern and Southern Cape overall sentiment was the second highest in the country. And again, that should be great news for you at 85%. And that outperformed the national by 5%. The sentiment towards um, property in the Eastern Cape was in the top five reaching 78% on the, on, on the index, while sentiments towards selling was the lowest on the index. The sentiments towards investing in property also matched the national 78% index, while the sentiment that we see towards selling or, or buying versus selling 
is 1% higher than the national index. And why we are seeing that at the moment is because it's more expensive. It's almost 15% more expensive to rent at the moment than to buy your overall prop, uh, um, to buy your, your, your own property. So, so what we see here is that all over, in the metros and in the non-metros, we saw an increase in what customers is experiencing, what customers are saying to us. The drivers for that sit in the demand side and in the in, in the in the in the in the sell side. And, and, and that is where that is where we should be very, very positive looking forward to know that that um, impact will absolutely drive our business going forward. And I'm going to touch on, 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 on the business as, as we go forward. So, so let, let us look um, on, on, on the next slide. Let us look at the homeowner sentiment by customer type. So, so what we see here is that all the customer types have actually improved in sentiments, all of them. And the majority of them to higher than the pre-COVID level, thus boosting overall con um, con confidence Two um, customer types that I would just like to, to highlight and, and, sh and show to you is the existing home buyers, and that is the orange line, here coming with that break come back here from the bottom, and then the dark purple one, which is the investor one. So if we look at the existing homeowners, they have always lacked all the others. If we go back on the, on the index right up to 2015, we will always find that your existing homeowners have lacked. But they have shown us in the last, towards the end of 2019, right up to 2020, with a 10% increase, where they have shown us a much stronger comeback than any one of the others. What we also saw is that investors, and they had the biggest or the highest drop-off in sentiment in the heart of lockdown. Why was that? Obviously, investors choose not to add to their property portfolio, and they would rather take a wait-and-see approach because the economic uncertainty as well as the sharp increase in rental defaults was just something that investors wanted to actually ride out. So if we are ever see how they, how they bounced back, they actually ended up the highest and even slightly above the first-time home buyers who drove most of the surge in our activities as more than 50% of all our bonds that we did last year was in the first time home buyer space. So investors coming back and again, that should give us a lot of confidence in what we are seeing in our markets at the moment. If we look at the buying versus the selling sentiments on our, on our next slide, just waiting for the slide there, there, there to change over. There we are. We, we see that the sentiments towards buying property returned to the 2019 levels much, much early, earlier than the sentiment towards the sale of properties. And, and towards the middle of 2019, we've already reached the, um, the pre-COVID uh, um, values and, 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 and benchmarks in the, in the sentiment towards buying. So people buying properties, that sentiment started to come back towards the middle of the, of the, um, of the pandemic or, or already. If, if we however look at the sentiments towards selling, this is still not recovered from our 2019 levels. So, so what are we seeing? We're actually seeing that the gap between a, a wanting to sell and the wanting to buy is actually continuing, continuing um, um, to, to, to widen. And, and that means that we have got more willing buyers than we have got sellers in the market at the moment. And, and to a certain extent, that is also then what is impacting um, on, on, on the upholding of the property prices. If we look at the, 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 um, the specific price segments of 750 to 1.5 million, where we actually had the most of our activity, it also places pressure on stock in, in this price segment. And this may result in these property prices starting to increase. So purchase prices have in general been higher as buyers have been reaching to buy more expensive properties given the uh, improvements and, 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 and the affordability due to the low in interest rates that we actually see. So in the, in the Eastern Cape, what did, what did we see? In Eastern Cape, we saw our average loan applications increase by 33% since 2019 to just over a million rand on, 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 on average. 
So what does the future hold for us? Let's have a look on, on the first one, just in terms of the interest rates. I think it will be important to see, because it's one of the main drivers, what is the interest rates holding for us in, 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 in future? We've, we've surely established by now that, that the low interest rate cycle has been the driver of the positive sentiment and also the coincidental increase in home purchases. And I mean, surely you guys have felt it every day because of the low uh, interest rate, people can now buy more. Those who couldn't afford can now afford, and those that could afford can now afford even a more expensive property. We below, we, we actually, on, on this stage, we uh, believe that the property um, or, or the inflation, the interest rate is, is right at the bottom of the cycle. And, 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 and they will return at their current levels or remain at their current levels until the end of this year, around about quarter four, in 2021, which is when they will start to gradually start to rise again. The rise, we believe, will however be gradual. And on and, 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 and this stage, it is our view that we will only return more or less to pre-lockdown levels by the end of 2023. So a very gradual um, return of our in interest rate. If we look at the, the house prices, we can, we can actually see that the recent developments that, 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 that I just showed you of in the number of willing buyers have absolutely placed upward pressure on prices. Although this remains to be seen because everybody is talking about whether this is a, whole, a buyer or a seller's market. Purchase prices have in general been higher and buyers have been reaching to buy more expensive property because of the, in, in, of the interest rates which absolutely play a major role in their affordability. So, so if, we, if we look at the market growth that we saw um, in, in our various provinces, um, I think it's also important to actually note that if you look at the red bars there, you will see that in 2020, all our regions actually performed lower than in 2019. And you can see in some instances, it's quite su su significant. If you look at the Western Cape, around about minus 16%, and, 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 and that played a major role in, in, in terms of what we saw in the business. Um, however, if, if even, even, with, even with the, um, the, with the, um, with the uptake in, in, the, in the second half of the year, we, we still haven't reached um, the, the, the full year-on-year -year type of capacity that we had or type of production that we have on, on, on the, the 2019 levels. So, so what we see here is that the top row, the dark row brown, that is predictions that we did in, in towards the end of, of 2020, and we did that for 2021. And you can see in all our regions, the expectations are positive across all regions. In Eastern Cape, we expect the market to grow by 5.6%, following on a negative from 7.8. So quite a significant growth that we expect in the Eastern Cape. And, and, and this will predominantly be driven by first time home buyers. And to a, to a large extent, we also see some investor business in, 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 in that as well. But first time home buyers will most definitely remain one of our key drivers in the Eastern Cape. Coming off 2020 with our applications in December, reaching 47% versus 2019, we think that the market might grow even more than what we have anticipated. And after two months of full performance in 2021, our application volumes absolutely continue to be so resilient, we are up 21% on February on last year, and that was before the pandemic. There's, there's most definitely still a, 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 um, a level of uncertainty in, in, in forecasting models at, at the moment. If you look at the deep office closure, if you look at the uncertainty of the third wave, and that just makes our crystal balls a little, 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 little murky at the moment. The one thing that holds true, however, and something that we've been seeing throughout the heart of the pandemic during 2020, is that South Africans has got an aspiration of owning your own home. That remains a core aspiration. And all of you, each and every one of you, have absolutely contributing, contribute to helping people to buy their own homes. Whether it is upgrade, whether it is further properties, whether it's investment properties, whether it's first time home buyers, but each of you played a role to make South Africans' dreams come true. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. 
um, today and, and, and thank you for joining us in housing the nation because that's what we do. We house the nation and we shape the industry in a meaningful way. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will, I'm gladly I'll take any, any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Um, I think we should do a virtual applause. We would have done that in the physical anyway. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for taking us through some of those insights. Very, very interesting. I have one question here from Ian van Jaarsveld, Dion. And he wants to know, what does APSA believe will be the drivers in Q4 of pushing interest rates up? Well, um, I, I think on, on this stage, we do see a slight recovery in our economy. I just saw some numbers this morning where, where we are currently at around about 0.8% already. And, and um, as the economy recovers, we will slightly see that increases in the interest rates. As we as we go forward, um, but but as we see it at the moment, very 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 gradually, very gradually. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mark van Heerden has a question as well. It's here in the Q and A box. Um, I'm going to upvote it. Then I have a legitimate reason to ask it. <laughs> and it's been upvoted. Thank you. <laughs> it's been upvoted a few more times. Properties are often sold higher than expected in the sellers' market. What is the expected market response going forward into 2022 and risks to the buyers of these properties, Dion? I think, I, I don't think it's a, it's a straightforward one-line answer to that. I mean, um, it is absolutely a willing buyer, willing seller. It's a combination of the two. And, 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 and that is what I, what I try to show when I show you that that currently that gap is still widening, but should the prices um, on, on, the, on, the, on the office, on, on houses start to increase and, and buyers are willing to pay for that, then, then surely that is going to drive what we've currently seen. As I mentioned, we've, we've, seen, we've seen almost a 33% increase in loan value application just in the Eastern Cape. And that is, that is a, a, a good indication that, that all of that will move together, but then, then it must be based on a willing buyer, willing seller principle. Thank you so much for that. Dion, I think there are no further questions. Everyone is giving you a, a virtual thank you. applause. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Anna Marie. We see your thank you, Zandali, Jeanette, Laura, Jean, and then also Feline and Kobe all saying thank you so much for, for sharing those insights with us uh, this morning. Let me double check and make sure there are no questions, no further questions. Um, no, I think that's it. Dion, you can get into the limo, Happiness. drive off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Thank you, Tracy, and thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to, to, to be part of, part of the session this morning. Wonderful. Thank you, Dion. Please stay with us. We're not going to be... Um, for much longer sure. and if anyone wants to join with you or join you or, or communicate with you you're more than welcome to click on the participants button next to the chat and q a button and you can send dion or any one of his colleagues a message if there are further insights that you want to maybe discuss um, or further insights you need to 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 have um outlined for you I think this part of the program is a bit of engagement and interaction. Please take out your cellular devices, take out your cell phones, and then go to www.menti.com. It will ask you for a code. The code is 45628137. 45628137. We are going to be asking you a couple of questions just to get a sense of really who's in the room. It helps us to come up with the, with the correct uh, content in the future. Please enter your name and sign up. And maybe if, if possible, enter your actual name. There we've got one person already. Feline is in, Esti is in, Celeste you're in, your head is of course your head is in, Ben is in, Michael is in. Let's see if we can get as many of us into the room as possible. Tell us your name. Tando, I can see you're in. 
Um, there we go. Some more people. Jalikina, you're in. Um, and then let's see what's happening on the chat. We'll give it a couple more minutes. The code Anna Marie is going to be pasted by Ben. Just check the chat box here. But just so you know, it's 4562837. Ben, if you can just drop that code into the chat so that it stays there. Thank you, Studio. 4562837. 4562837. Okay, let's give it a few more minutes. I think the only thing that this platform needs is like a DJ, <laughs> some music. Um, all right, I think we've got quite a number of people in studio, Ian, and lights. Yes, your head. Some disco lights would always uh, brighten up a Monday morning, isn't it? 4562817. Three, seven. That is the Menti code. We're about to ask a few questions. The option, the answers will be on your device in your hand and uh, you select your response and then I will see the, the answers on the screen here that's controlled by studio. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready? Studio, can we get started with the first question, please? Are we in? Are we in? Fatima? Sharon, Sharon, you're not able to join. Okay, try again. Let's try again. The first question is what is what is your job title or role within your company? Are you options are CEO, direct executive, franchise owner, second option, principal agent, managing broker, estate agent, intern, and other? Those are your options. And let's see who's actually in the room with us today. Yep. There's uh, more of estate agents, interns, then followed by other. Maybe in the chat box, can you tell me what other is? What is other in the chat box? 11 people said other. Let's see what other is. Investor. There we go. Operations and admin manager. Lightstone training consultant. Leasing administrator. PA. Fantastic. All right. Right. There we go. This obviously Nexus is an event that we've put together for industry, sharing insights together, having conversations about how to take this industry forward. And so thank you, your head data and data and analytics. Our next question is what type of real estate transactions do you specialize in sales and rentals sales only or rentals only? Hi, Fatima, you're from Property Practitioners, Port Elizabeth. Sales only, Erin. Sales only, that's Erin Branford. And then Mala is also letting us know that she specializes in sales only. And now, sales only. Okay, there we go. So 24 responses for sales only, and then 14 for sales and rentals. And then, of course, seven of the respondents specifically focusing on rentals. I'm sure you're going to be looking forward to the pay prop presentation that uh, that is going to be taking place shortly. Let's get into the next question. A few more questions in this menti, menti meter. Uh, when, okay, this is my favorite question. Like this is This is my question. Do you multitask when attending virtual meetings? meetings or online events yes are you guilty are you does your mind tend to wander are you 100 percent focused or sometimes sometimes depending on where you find yourself and what's happening around you and in your vicinity um but yeah i think the great majority of us it's kind of like a yes we are we are multitasking we are a little bit guilty, so I think this is where these sort of engagements help because we tend to, uh, the engagement brings us back into the room. All right, sometimes Lulene Liebenberg, Lulene Liebenberg, I think I hope that I said your name right. Mala, yes, outright yes, 100%, sometimes from Natalie. And Henry, 100%. Okay, let's try to get you guys back into the room. Let's go to the next question, please, studio. Uh, and this is the question that we always ask. 
which is in your opinion as an industry professional and practitioner is it a buyer's market or a seller's market look at how those responses are flowing in what do you think is it a buyer's market is it a seller's market both ian both okay wonderful wonderful let's keep going let's keep the responses coming in viv barton you're saying it's a buyer's market and we need an option for both okay that's a nice uh, bit of feedback there maybe ben you can we can add that as an option three you know is it a buyer's market or is it a seller's market so many of you are saying that it is very definitely a buyer's market. And then Charmaine, along with a few other colleagues on the call, saying that it's actually both at the moment. Lulene Liebenberg also concurring that it's both. Natalia de Ridder, thank you for that, telling us that it's both. And Adeline, you think it's a buyer's market. I wonder which one of our guests would be keen on uh, joining me on the stage and giving me a rationale, one for buyers and one for sellers and one for both. Think about it. Um, let me know in the chat if you're keen to switch on your camera and give me your opinion. I would absolutely welcome that. Think of this section um, in the olden days when someone would get the mic and you'd have to stand up and you'd have to say a few words. Okay, I think let's move on to the next question in one word. We're almost at our networking break, which won't be very long, but it's a great opportunity for you to engage. Let's go to the next question in one word. How would you describe 2021 so far? Not 2020, 2021. Are you getting my answers? Is a question that Christina Jacoba Jordan is asking. I can hear you, Christina. I'm going to ask Ben to reach out to you, and if he can maybe take your question, then he can put it into the chat for us. All right, harsh. Yes, that's a word I've heard, Marla. I've heard that word. In fact, I think a lot of us are, are suffering from a little bit of PTSD. Unpredictable, amazing, challenging. But uh, the, I think the overwhelming sentiment here, challenging, exciting, lucrative roller coaster buzzing with activity demanding uncertain amazing this is always a very interesting um, um question that people when the way in which people answer do we think it's better than 2020 i think it is um viv barton you're saying that it's difficult we hear you we absolutely agree with you let's go into the next Next question, Cecilia, it's booming. Where are you joining us from, Cecilia? We want to come visit you. Last question in the mentee section. If you could change one thing in the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? If you could change one thing in the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? It can be a sentence. You can give us maybe a few, a few words. So interesting how the same responses come through. EAAB response time, productivity from the EAAB, the regulator, lowball offers, getting rid of poppy, EAAB, the EAAB, getting rid of the EAAB, which is also very different, regulation, more stock, let's scroll down a little bit, improvement in the deeds office, processing time, Alle agenten, geregistreerde agenten, moet wees, all agents must be registered agents. Is that what the comment is saying? I'm not 100% sure. Maybe drop it in the chat for me so I can understand. More stock. You definitely like to see more stock. And then, of course, something that uh, I think a few people would probably also ask to have changed is the monthly salary subsidy inequality and lack of transformation this is the second time that's come through since i mean since last year buyers can only do an offer once the bank has authorized the approval including credit done so offers are automatically final okay so that's uh, one of the industry um, aspects or elements that you would change a sense of urgency from our colleagues at the eaab more stock 
And then Cecilia, something that we're very, very passionate about here at Private Property is educating that first time home buyers. Of course, we all know that it's an incredibly daunting, biggest purchase of your life. Um, so we want to be that brand that's there for the individuals wanting to to get into that market. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, loyalty from platform that agency used to advertise their property, not allow private sellers to advertise. I hear you, we hear you Fatima. Um, and then EAAB office turnaround time. Okay, so we're gonna leave that there for now. Um, thank you for sharing your comments through. And thank you for sharing your, your, your opinions through with us. We're now going to take a five minute break. We'll be back again in five minutes. I'm going to suggest that when you do go into this networking break, if you switch on your camera, you are going to be able to see who else is on the table with you. You are also able to move around from table to table. And if you look on the right hand side of your screen, you'll be able to see all the different floors that are there. I think the last time I checked, there was about five different floors. So five minutes for networking. When we come back, we'll have your head Smith and we will have Jan Davel from PayProp and they'll be taking us through some insights for the rental, rental market. All right, everyone, enjoy. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Laura Jean. Some pumping music in the breaks would be absolutely awesome. <laughs> I fully, fully agree. I've had a little bit of coffee. Um, I don't know about you. Are you back at your seat? Let's have a seat. We're back for the second session of our first Nexus. Of course, this Nexus is brought to you in partnership with our, our partners, APSA, and also a big thank you to the next speakers that I'll be bringing up now. PayProp, Head of Data Analytics, Yohet Smith and Smuts and the CEO of PayProp, Jan Davo, will be taking us through the 2020 rental marketing review and what the future holds. Studio, let's bring them up in the meantime. I'll just ask that they leave their microphones off for now as I continue to introduce them. And then um, I'll hand over to them so they can take us through their their um, talk. They'll also be giving us a sneak peek at PayProp State of the Rental Market survey results before the release next quarter. So we're incredibly, incredibly privileged to have that from them. Let's bring on PayProp. I think both your head and Jan are in the room. I saw them saying hello earlier in the chat. Hello, your head. Always good to see you. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Enjoy, guys. Okay, so let me share my screen and hope that I can do it correctly. You know, sometimes I'm better with math than with technology. Um, there we go. I'm hoping that you can see the correct screen. Can someone confirm for me whether or not you can see the correct screen, please? All right, great, guys. So um, I am going to switch off my camera because I want to encourage you to make the presentation full screen because there will be quite a few graphs um, with some details so that you can um, do that. Sorry, here we go. All right. Okay, so please feel free to uh, make that one big and then I'm going to switch off my camera for this and then I'll switch back on once I'm done. All right, so as Tracy said, I'll be chatting to you about what happened in the rental market during the year of 2020. Of course, as you can imagine, um, COVID and lockdown played a big role in what we saw in the rental market. So I want to chat to you about four things. Rent firstly, 
And then arrears, I think most of you um, know that arrears uh, worsened during the course of the year, but I also have some good news around it. Then third, we'll look at some credit metrics. And then lastly, as Tracy said, you guys will be the first to see some of the state of the rental industry survey results. All right, so looking at rent, if we look at national rental growth, the red line and inflation, the blue line over the last two years, we can see that rental growth trailed below inflation for most of the last year, two years. Um, and you can also see there at the end of the red line that rental growth actually dipped below the zero line um, in November. What that means is from November 2019 to November 2020, rent actually got a little bit cheaper. I know it is only 10 rand, but it's the, it's the principle that's, that's, that feels so wrong. Rent should be going up and up. Um, but we experienced the first negative rental growth um, ever since we launched the Paypal Rental Index in 2012. So hopefully in the years to come, this will improve a bit, but we don't expect it to shoot the lights out anytime soon. So what are the reasons for this? There are two factors. There's a demand side and a supply side. So on the demand side, affordability obviously plays a big role. Many tenants lost their income, whether that was um, fully or partially, and that obviously affected their ability to afford either higher rents and also large rental increases. So because the demand for more expensive properties dropped a bit, that um, put downward pressure on the prices. Then on the supply side, we have two factors um, affecting the rental growth. The first is, I think we saw this everywhere, um, but it's, I guess in touristy places also quite a lot, because no one could travel during lockdown for most of 2020. Uh, many Airbnb properties that were on the shorter market stood empty and those owners uh, moved it to the long-term rental market. So that increased the supply and puts down the pressure on price. And secondly, is that because of the low interest rate, now is a really good time to buy properties, especially um, for investors who want to buy, um, buy to get properties. So many of them actually bought properties, pushed that into the rental market, and that also um, affected the supply. So if you have low demand and high supply, both of those contribute to, to lower prices. If we look at this, basically the same statistics, just um, on a quarterly level, and we add a trend line, you can see what we've already seen. Over the past two years, rental growth just trended downward for most of the last year. And I think it's, it's worth noting that even before lockdown, even before the second quarter of 2020, rental growth was already under pressure. If you take this graph um, like a year or so further backwards, uh, rents were at 6-7%. So, like I said, we don't expect this to change anytime soon. I'm not really expecting it to go into negative territory um, if we look at the quarterly um, rental growth, but you can see it is under severe pressure. And you can see from 2020's first quarter to second quarter, rental growth literally halved. Now, let's compare this to the Eastern Cape stats to the national average. You can see the Eastern Cape is in red. That really paints quite a different picture than the national growth. Um, rental growth rates were trending upward, except for the second quarter in 2020, that was the first quarter of lockdown, but then recovered really well in quarter three and actually had the highest year-on-year -year rental growth in the last quarter out of all the provinces at 3.9% that is significantly higher than what we saw nationally, a growth of 0.2%. If we look at the Western Cape, this picture is unfortunately not so rosy garden route. Um, you can see there in the last three quarters of 2020, there was actually negative rental growth. So again, what that means is this is a year on year figure. So the 0.5% negative rental growth in quarter four means that 
from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the fourth quarter of 2020, rent became half percent cheaper. Luckily, the Western Cape wasn't the only one with negative rental growth. We actually saw five provinces with negative rental growth during the last quarter of this year. So in the very beginning of this graph, you can see the Eastern Cape just shooting the lights out at 3.9%, um, even though the Eastern Cape is the second cheapest um, province to rent in, the Western Cape is still the most expensive, even with that, those three quarters of negative growth. Moving on to arrears. So again, I will I will tell you about the national pattern and then we will compare the provincial stats to this. So when we look at arrears, we look at two things. We look at the percentage of tenants in arrears. And then secondly, we look at what is the average arrears size relative to rent. And these two metrics followed slightly different patterns, um, but I'll talk about them um, in a bit. Right, so if we look at the percentage tenants in arrears, we can see that um, started the year of quarter one at just below 20%, and then that first quarter of lockdown, that shot up to 25%. That means that one in four tenants were actually in arrears, which really isn't great. You can see that that has, um, that's recovered significantly back to 20.9%, so we're still not at a pre-lockdown level, um, but we are at least moving in the right direction. Then if we look at the average arrears percentage, this followed a slightly different pattern. It started before lockdown, started the year out at 78%, and then peaked in the third quarter in a, at 104.6%. So just over one month's rent was the average arrear size. Um, when, when a tenant was in arrears. So if we compare the Eastern Cape stats to this, you can see the dark red is the Eastern Cape. It followed the same pattern, but um, was the percentage in, tenants in arrears were higher throughout the year. Started the year at 20.9%, peaked in the second quarter, and then ended the year at 22.6%. So also, like the national number, not quite where we were before lockdown. Now, if we look at average area size, here are some good news for the Eastern Cape, at least. These levels were below the national average also throughout the year. Started at 70%, peaked at just under one month's rent in quarter three, and then ended the year at 92%. So average area is Average arrears is a bit more sticky than percentage tenants in arrears um, due to people losing their income. Uh, this might be a bit more sticky. So we expect to see a, a slower recovery than with the number of tenants in arrears. Looking at the Western Cape, the Western Cape had the lowest percentage of tenants in arrears, um, but also followed the same pattern started the year at 15% and ended at 18. Look at arrear sizes in the Western Cape, um, not quite so good. Started the year at 68% below the national average, peaked at 106, which was more than the national average, and also recovered uh, a bit down in the last quarter to 94%, but that is quite a way off the below 70 that we saw before lockdown. So some of the reasons for the trends that we've seen in arrears is when lockdown was first announced in March, um, many tenants, because they didn't know if they were um, going to get full income, they might have stopped paying their rent in full due to that cash flow uncertainty. And then when it was announced that everyone could go back to work um, in June, many people again started paying uh, their rent in full and where possible paid their arrears off. Average arrears percentage followed a bit of a different pattern. Tenants with low arrears, like I just said, were able to clear their debt and mathematically if the low arrears um, are paid off, then the average will shoot up. 
And like I said, this remaining arrears are actually a bit sticky. Um, if you think about it, for this number to actually go down, a tenant would have to pay his full rental plus some more on top of that. And that is just not possible for everyone um, in the current economic climate. Moving on to credit metrics. So how we determine our credit metrics is we look at all the, um, the credit metrics of the credit checks that were done through our system within a quarter. So it doesn't track the pool of tenants. It rather looks at the type of person and who is actually applying for a rental property. So keep that in mind when you go through these. So we look at quite a few metrics and I won't talk about all of them, but we look at income, the growth of income, um, how many tenants had major delinquencies and that would include notices against your name. Um, if you were more than three months in arrears on any account over the last year, uh, any defaults against your name, and then debt to income ratio is exactly that. How much of your monthly net income do you use or do you do you pay on your um, servicing your debt? Rent to income, again, what percentage of your net income do you spend on rent every month? Um, affordability is the sum of those two. Uh, disposable income is what you have left after you paid your debt and your rent. And the credit score is, again, uh, self-explanatory, just the credit check. So you'll see for most of these um, throughout the year, from quarter one to quarter two, many of them actually deteriorated quite a bit. I'm thinking here major delinquencies, um, affordability not really, um, disposable income was actually not too bad. Um, but from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, things didn't actually deteriorate as much as I expected. You can even see the credit score, the national credit score, actually increased a bit. Now, an interesting one that I just want to point out is the debt to income ratio. At the beginning of the year, on average, people spend almost half of their salary, of their net salary, on debt. So that includes your cell phone payments and your DSTV and your car, that type of thing. And then interest rates just dropped by three and a half um, percentage points to 7%. And you can see how the debt to income ratio actually improved during the year. So a lot of that is um, due to that lower interest rate. If we compare the Eastern Cape, and I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna talk too much about it. I just want to show where the Eastern Cape is compared to um, the national statistics. So income in the Eastern Cape is a bit lower than national. Rental growth in the last quarter was a bit lower. Um, there's slightly more um, tenants with delinquencies, which isn't great. Good news is that the debt to income ratio is actually a bit lower, meaning people spend less of their net income on their debt repayments. Rent is more or less in line. Um, on average, they have a higher percentage of disposable income. Um, but overall, looking at their credit score, it is a bit lower than the national. Moving on to the Western Cape, there's some good news here. Again, high income levels, I think the highest in the country. Um, a bit uh, slower on the rental growth side, but uh, looking at tenants, very few or a lot, a lot less than, than nationally um, have delinquencies. Lower debt ratios higher disposable income, and also higher credit scores. So the overall health of tenants in the Western Cape are um, a bit better than what we've seen nationally. So why did the credit metrics improve? And I, when I say that, I mean overall, if you look at the credit score. So there are a few possible reasons. Um, so this isn't necessarily fact or science, but rather educated guess. Lower income tenants, as we know, in the economy were hit harder when it came to job losses. Um, and it's possible that those, those lower income tenants actually left the rental market and moved in with family and friends um, if they could and where they could. So over the short term, they actually exited the rental market. It could also be that tenants are staying longer within their property and not moving into a more expensive property. 
and that could mean that a rental agent might not necessarily do a fresh credit check on this person. On the other side, maybe because of lockdown and financial pressures, tenants are a bit more responsible financially. Maybe they paid off some of their debt uh, with all that money that they're not spending on restaurants and booze. Um, like I said, the lower interest rate also had an effect on the debt to income ratio that we could see. Um, but I must say, was it, I was surprised because I thought that because it's such a buyer's market, according to some at the moment, um, that your good tenants would move out of the rental market and buy their own property, maybe instead of renting. Um, but that luckily is not the case. There are still good tenants out there to fill your rental properties. Moving on to the fun bit. The paper state of the rental industry. So this, we first did, did this at the end of 2019. Um, you can download this, those survey results from our website. I'll give you a link in a second. Um, and these, this survey we sent out again at the end of last year, and I put the results together, and you can have a sneak peek of this um, right here today. So who took part? 95% um, of um, survey respondents actually was in the industry. That is to be expected. 70%, um, 69% were either a business owner or a rental agent. So it gives you an idea of the, the viewpoint of which, from which these questions were answered. And then I was a bit surprised to see that um, almost two thirds of respondents um, managed less than 150 properties. So no extremely large rental books, um, less than 150 um, overall. So we had a few um, categories. The first one was technology. And not surprisingly, 55% of respondents said that they increased the use of technology um, in their business during COVID. And I mean that with distributed working and working from home was just a necessity and 55% uh, of people actually increased their use of technology. 70% of people said that they believe that virtual viewings and 3D tours are here to stay. Um, and I think I, I do agree with them. And there's a lot of great technology out there um, that can facilitate um, these um, services. And then interestingly, 69% um, of people said that it is more productive to increase automation than to increase the workforce. So this to me is an example of work smarter and not harder. Moving on to a few um, rental portfolio questions. And again, a lot of these are due to COVID, but 70% said that the rental increases that they put through in 2020 was lower than normal. 93% of people um, have made payment arrangements with tenants during COVID. So that really, it was a shockingly high number to me, um, but that just shows you how many tenants were actually affected by loss of income or even if it's just a household income, um, that took a bit of a knock. 93% of agents made payment arrangements with tenants. 55% of respondents said that they see more vacant properties now than that they had a year ago. And this um, could also be due to the oversupply of rental properties that I mentioned earlier. And then lastly, 64% of respondents said that they lowered their commission in order to keep a landlord. Why is this a problematic number? Because commission is your main income in a rental business. And once you've lowered that commission percentage, it is very hard to push it back up. And I understand that most people do this out of necessity, um, but it is just something to keep in mind. How are you going to change going forward? Then looking at challenges, we looked at current challenges and um, the challenges that they foresee for the year ahead. 51% of respondents said that their biggest, single biggest um, challenge is to find good tenants. 68% of respondents said that 
the biggest worry for 2020 is the ongoing effect of COVID on their rental business. Not all bad news though. Um, the last question of the survey was how optimistic are you about the future of the rental industry? Only 5% were pessimistic, 17% were either were neutral about this, and then a whopping 78% said that they are optimistic about the future of the rental market. Find this again a surprising number because the year before, before we even knew that COVID existed, this figure was actually 62%. So maybe we are all thinking about business and life a bit differently, but it is really it's great to see that overall people are still optimistic about the future of the rental market. If you wanna know a bit more about what I spoke today um, on the rent and arrears and credit metrics, you can download the annual um, rental index at uh, za.paycrop.com forward slash rental index. That is the year in review. I'm going to stop sharing and then um, over to Jan, who will tell you a bit about the future of the rental index. I mean, the rental market. Thank you. Thank you, Yuit. Um, can I just make sure I'm not muted? Doesn't look like it. So uh, good day, everybody. It's, uh, it's our absolute privilege and, uh, and honor to participate in this event. I want to thank Amasi, Tracy Lee, Carl, Ben, and the rest of the team at Private Property for affording us this exceptional opportunity. Now, um, today I just want to share some insights, and I did not prepare any PowerPoint presentation because I think that should have been titled uh, Death by PowerPoint, should I have done that. I actually just want to point you and maybe create an awareness of one or two things that we do need to take cognizance of as estate agents. I think there might be a little positive news in that. And um, without any further ado, I'm going to tell you that I just want to point out one or two sections of the New Property Practitioners Act that was promulgated or published on 3 October 2019. And then we're going to look at the draft regulations that are not published yet, but that could have a significant influence on the business of property practitioners. Now, you may be, wonder, may be wondering why we all as estate agents are still working in accordance with the old act, the Estate Agency Affairs Act of 1976. Uh, it's a 45 year old piece of legislation and I think it's overdue for replacement, and most of you would probably agree with me. As this act dates back to an era before internet, digital marketing, social media, and very importantly from our perspective, it dates back to an era before automated and integrated payment uh, service providers such as Paycrop. Um, now, we must remember that the new act only sets the broad principles of the new law. It doesn't yet speak about its implementation. That is the function of the regulations and we are still awaiting those regulations but the draft um, the draft has been published, uh, it has been published and we've been waiting, we've been commenting on it and uh, the, the period for comments was extended to 20 November of last year and now we wait. Now we don't know exactly when these new regulations are going to bring the New Property Practitioners Act into operation, but we do know it is going to happen, probably or very likely, uh, in terms of the last draft that we've seen. Now, if I can now share my screen, I'm going to start with referring you to the Act. That's the Property Practitioners Act, and I want to start at section 54 which is basically the a repeat of what we know as Section 32 in terms of the Estate Agency Affairs Act. Um, I, I can see my screen. I hope you can all do that too. See that too. So if we, if we consider Section 54, and um, I'm, this is just on my screen, so I'm going to scroll around trying not to make you all seasick. But if we consider the contents of Section 54 of the Property Practitioners Act, you will see there it is still all the, 
all the must-dos for estate agents. And it starts off saying that every property practitioner must open and keep one or more separate trust account. It carries on to say that you must appoint an auditor and then you must notify the authority. That's the new name for the Estate Agency Affairs Board of who your auditors are. And then it carries on and it tells you exactly what the intention of the law is when we talk of trust monies, client monies. And it, section five or subsection five of section 54 gives you all the musts. And then we can go through these different languages used here. And this is pretty, very similar, pretty much similar to what you know under section 32. But what is new and what I just want to point out to you as I don't think that any of the other commentators on the subject matter have really focused on it. I want to point, uh, I want to show you the contents of section 23. I want to point you towards it because I think it could be good news for some of you and it's very important for some of you to take cognizance of it. I mean, I can find this, I'm going to 23, 27. So I hope you're not seasick by now yet. Um, 25, and now we need to get to the English, there. I'm going to take it to the top of the screen, hopefully you can all see it. Section 23 of the Property Practitioners Act deals with exemptions in respect of accounting records and trust accounts. And it's stated there that a property practitioner whose turnover is below 2.5 million rand must cause his, her, or accounting records to be subjected to an independent review by a registered accountant subject to certain provisions. And the minister may by notice in the government gazette determine the circumstances under which certain property practitioners may be exempted from keeping trust accounts and determine a different dispensation for the review of accounting records for those property practitioners. So the good news here, and since the South African property market is so fragmented, there are many agencies with a turnover below two and a half million rand. And there are many startups, newcomers. So the intention of this legislation is that they may, under certain circumstances, be an exemption for you to keep accounting record, or to, firstly, to have trust accounts, and secondly, to have those audited. This will have significant cost advantages to those small uh, property practitioners or state agencies. And now we need to understand more about that. Now, this section 23 explains the intention of the act. It doesn't say how it's going to be implemented. And that's why it's important that you now start taking cognizance of the regulations. As I say, this is not final, these are drafts. But when we consider um, section four of the draft regulations of 2020 that will soon be enacted, it deals with the details of exemption from trust accounts. Now, pursuant to the provisions of section 23 that I've just pointed to um, um, show to you, a property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if he's, and then there are certain conditions, uh, certain circumstances, and then it, it deals with it in detail. I don't want to read it all to you. It will be definitely there by PowerPoint, but what I do want to point out very specifically is section 4.4 of the draft regulations. So exemptions are subject to certain things. You don't keep, you haven't kept monies. You say that you won't be keeping monies. You are below certain thresholds. And very importantly, you are otherwise compliant. Then you may apply for, you can apply for exemption. There's a prescribed procedure and attached to these uh, regulations. There are certain examples. If I scroll up, is an affidavit that you can do and that will then accompany your application for exemption. But section 4.4 says that a property practitioner will be exempted from operating a trust account regardless of your turnover. If such property practitioner is otherwise compliant with the provisions of this regulation and then certain other uh, subconditions. Now the contents of Section 4.4 is very important to property practitioners that utilize systems or payment service providers such as Pipro because it says here in 
that you can be exempted if you are otherwise compliant and you as the state entity, as the state agency has mandated one or more other property practitioners that specialize in collecting and distributing trust payments. And those entities like BIPROP will be called payment processing agents. Then if, if you are otherwise compliant, you don't use your own trust money. If you use an accredited payment processing agent and meet other criteria, you can be exempted. When we look at the details of this, firstly, it's important to understand that your payment processor or payment processing agency must also be a property practitioner that is compliant with all these applicable legislation and regulations. That property uh, processing agent, like PayProp, must operate a trust environment that complies with these acts, like PayProp has been doing. And it's important to notice here that it is a trust environment in which, if we look at 4.4.3, each and every client of, of the PayProp, the, pay, the processing agent, must have separately audible client accounts, both in respect of each estate agency to whom it provides a service and in respect of each client of the estate agency. In other words, each landlord and each tenant. Now, the trust environment with all these segregated trust funds is what is required for you to apply for exemption under this regulation and then 4.4.4, the trust environment and each of the client accounts operated by the payment processing agent, your pay prop, are audited annually in compliance with the Act and the regulation. So just a heads up, as I say, I'm not trying to give you legal advice. I'm merely trying to show you what is in the regulations already. And I think the good news is that estate agencies or going forward what we refer to as as uh, what will be referred to as property practitioners, will be able to apply for exemption from keeping trust accounts subject to certain conditions. Secondly, paying for audits because a duly authorized, recognized payment processor like BIPROP can assist you with all these audit requirements. There must be a trust environment where everything is date stamped, uh, with proper audit trials, etc. So I think the intention has been underpinned by the minister or the legislator in these draft regulations. And although we don't know exactly what the future holds in terms of when it's going to be in operation, I think um, it's safe to say that probably within the next couple of months, you will be able to apply for exemption. You will be able to save a fortune on, on audit costs because uh, an independent auditor will simply have to review your books once you have complied with these regulations. Once again, when exactly it's going to be an operation, we don't know, but I think, we think it is important that you take cognizance, seek legal advice, see whether you can apply for this. PayProp has been uh, complying with all these provisions for the last 16 years. We're confident that our uh, clients will benefit greatly, great cost saving opportunities, and obviously something to look into now that we're also almost, we're almost at the first anniversary of COVID. It's been 353 days. So this environment that will save you money, save you time is important to, to consider. I see I've got a question. Will the EIA be renamed as we are now property practitioners versus estate agents? Indeed. Uh, it will be an authority of some sorts, like the FSB, known as Strange to the Financial Conduct, Financial Services Conduct Authority. The EIAB will have a new name uh, that will have a different function. It will have different structures. There will be ombudsmen. So, yes, uh, when the draft regulations are finalized, all of this will be brought into operation. And those of you who do not wish to operate trust funds and have audits and all the stresses and costs around that, please have a look at uh, section 54, section 23, and regulation 4, more specifically, 4.4. Back to you. Thank you, Tracy Lee, unless there are further questions.
I think um, we are really up against the time here, but I'm really grateful that your head is still in the chat and she is answering questions directly. Um, I think you've already answered the question in the Q&A, will the EAB be renamed? So thank you for that. Jan, thank you so much. Thank you to PayProp for agreeing to, to come and, uh, and join us today. And we obviously look forward to hosting a few more of these events over the next four days. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Tracy Lee. A pleasure. I love when people say my full name, <laughs> Tracy Lee. All right, so I think for we, we, we are a little bit running out of time, but what an incredibly informative session. Do you agree with me? Was that something that, uh, that really is going to make you think? Um, really just thank you to Jan for, for pointing out those sections in the act. It, I think it just deepens our conversation. It's very, very informative. Um, and I almost feel like we need a session just on the act itself. And, uh, and maybe where we can entertain some of these questions that are coming through as well. But um, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to give us a little bit more of your time. Yes, Shad and I agree. Thank you to Jan for pointing out the different sections under the Act. Absolutely. It's completely, completely going to help us. If you want us to do another session just on that, let us know in the chat box. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome onto the stage Private Properties Business Development Executive, Carl Vandenberg. And he's going to give us a glimpse into what Private Properties brand is going to potentially, uh, what the future holds for the brand, as well as what true partnership with the industry is going to look like going forward. Let me ask uh, Carl to join us on the stage. Give me a thumbs up if you're still in the room. I can see 96 of us are still here. Hello, Carl. How are you, my best colleague? <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, how are you doing? Tracy Lee, sorry, how are you doing? My whole name, say my whole name. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, take it away. And afterwards, if there are any more questions, um, I think we just have a final mentee to do. But we should be uh, we should be over in, in a very short while. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, thank you to to everybody in the private property extended family for joining us today. It's it's an absolute privilege to be able to spend some time with you. You know, we we prefer to be in a, in the physical world, but um, this is is the next best option. A big thank you to to Dion from Absa for his insights, as well as Jan and your head from from PayProp. It's a uh, Again, it's just such a great privilege that we, we get to be able to share some of the information that we have as part of property and, and with our partners. So really today, I'm just going to talk and, you know, I see that the time is running out. So I really just want to talk through, you know, where private property is and where we're going. What are the digital trends and, and what it is that you can expect out of private property? And then uh, Celeste will come and join us onto the stage. Celeste is our provincial head. Uh, for KZN, Garden Roots, the Eastern Cape and Free State. And she'll start giving you some really good insights in terms of what we're seeing from a property portal around what's happening in your specific areas. So really, let's just start. You know, who is who is private property? Um, well, we choose to be the trusted partner in, in, in real estate. And we talk about a, a property ecosystem, and we truly are in the center of this property ecosystem. And what's on either side of us? Well, we've got two sides, really. And one is the consumer. We refer to the consumer as people that are shopping for properties, people that are buying and really intent in around buying them. What we've got on the, on the right hand side is yourself, which we would refer to as clients or partners. Now, it seems quite easy to say that we choose to be in the center of this and we choose to be the trusted partner, but the reality is it's really, really difficult. It's quite a bit of a balancing act. And let me explain why. So if we choose to be not in the center and a little bit more closely aligned, let's say to yourselves as real estate agents, we then run the risk of alienating our consumers. And there's 57 million people in this country. There's a whole lot of people that are interested in buying property. So you run the risk then, if we listen to one side of the field, we run the risk of losing the consumers. Those are the millions and millions and millions of people that are on Power Properties portal every month looking at your properties. What happens then is they vote with their feet and they go elsewhere. If we also, if we go a little bit too much to the consumer side, we've got 57 million people that are very, very happy, but our clients who we hold near and dear to our heart, which is yourselves, 
then we get alienate you guys. So it's a lot easier to say we choose to be in the center of the ecosystem. We do choose, we understand our role in this, but it is a bit of a balancing act. Just in terms of, you know, how does that we become this trusted partner? The one is really to be completely obsessed around what our, our clients and our consumers are needing. And if around what both sides of this world want, it's a lot easier for us to be able to solve these real problems. And that's what we do. It's no longer a case of, you know, just being a marketing arm, really, and just showing off properties. We need to solve real world problems for both our clients, yourselves, as well as consumers that are wanting to purchase property. And the only way to really do that nowadays is through digital and through, uh, through technologies. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking around that just now. If you get these first two right, you've again, then got the opportunity to create valuable propositions. And that value proposition really talks around linking the buyer to the, the agent or to the property as such. So this is how it is that we're choosing to do it. Where are we going? We've got a five-year strategy. I'll talk a little bit about it now, but our ultimate goal in the next couple of years is to have five million unique viewers coming onto our property portal every single month and viewing your properties. Some things around where we are now, we are now averaging 3.2 million unique viewers every single month coming on, which is double what we were doing in 2019. So things are moving. I know we've had a lot of conversations with real estate agents and, and principals and the like, and everybody is saying to us that it's tangible. They can see the difference. There is absolute value that private property is giving to our clients. So that's really, really good news. In terms of our five-year strategy, you know, we started in, in sort of the back end of 2019, really preparing and really thinking around what it is that we wanted to do. Last year was our foundation year. Um, and we did some really, really amazing things. One was we rebranded. If anybody noticed, we look not only look cons uh, considerably different, but we also act very, very differently. We engage with our consumers quite differently to what you've seen in the past. This year, for private property is the watershed moment. This is our year of innovation. And I'll pack it and pack it a little bit more just now. And then we go into reposition, optimization, and then scale. It is all about scale that needs to be the, the real end goal because then it's value for everybody once we're dealing with more than 5 million people a month and we've got the market share that we're wanting out of, out of our clients. You know, as I mentioned just now, that private property looks considerably different. I don't even remember looking that blue and red anymore. I only see us as green. I see us as a very, very different organization. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping and put it into the comments there, but I completely feel that we're seen as a very, very different entity. It's not just how we look, it's how we act as well. That's really, really important. So I think the, the gist of the conversation was really around digital technology and we're a digital business and, and that's, that's a good thing for all of us. Um, so we talk around, you know, are we evolving around um, prop tech and fintech or is it a revolution? So we need to understand what is an evolution and what is a revolution and, and I'll stick to just digital stuff. An evolution would be something like Moore's Law. So Moore's Law spoke around um, how quickly processing on computers could, uh, could essentially evolve. So the Moore's Law speaks around the processing power of a market chip um, uh, doubling every two years. So if you look at that in a short amount of time, so if you look over a five year period, that is a significant change and you would see it as a revolution in digital technology. But Moore's Law has been around since the 1970s. So if you plot it out over a long graph, there's gradual changes. That's really an evolution of technology. What's an example of revolution? Well, a year ago today, none of us heard of Remo, none of us used Teams, none of us had Zoom. We have been forced into an a complete revolution around technology. And it's come with its pain, it's come with its understanding, but it really has been an amazing journey over the last year. We work very, very differently. We used to have beautiful offices in Amschlange and Durban with 180 degree sea views. I now work from home and I'm praying that none of my kids come running through the house and disrupt this meeting. But this is our lives now. So really, that's the difference between an evolution and a revolution. If we have a look at how consumers have changed as well, there's a significant change around how people shop for property and how people buy property. And we've got to know this. We need to understand that this has changed. So we saw, I saw in one of the, the previous, I think it was your head uh, slide, your head spoke around, you know, how consumers are, are, are engaging with virtual reality and Matterport and the rest of it. That's absolutely one element. Consumers are now spending a considerable more time researching a property before making contact with an agent. Now, that's a good thing because I know a life of, a, of an agent is incredibly tough. You list a property and next thing you get 500 leads. 
you need to start being able to understand and decipher what is a quality lead and what is not. So essentially what separates the buyers from the shoppers. And that's really the, 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 the role that private property has to make going forward. Another comment that I wanted to make around digital technology is we always use this word around it's disruptive. You know, we're going to be the disruptor in the industry. Um, and I think over the years it's become sort of quite a negative connotation, right? So people see disruptive or um, being a disruptor in prop tech as cutting out the real estate agent or doing this that fundamentally changes how we do it. Private property and myself, we've got a very, very different way around it. You were seen around one of my earlier slides around working with our consumers, coming up with value propositions that have that benefit all. And to us as digital, it's how do we uh, create solutions for your daily problems as real estate agents as well as for clients. So disruption is not should not always be seen as a negative thing. We see it as a very, very positive thing because it creates efficiency. Just in terms of, uh, I mentioned 2021 is the private property's year of technology. It absolutely is. You're going to be seeing in the next couple of months and um, probably halfway through the year, we're going to be making some fundamental changes to this business. We started working on this well into halfway through last year. So we really are very, very far down the road. And essentially, without giving too much, and we'll share a lot of the information when we, we get a lot closer to Well, a much better oiled machine around both a consumer engagement as well as a client side. So again, consumer is the shoppers, the client is yourselves. So what we want is we want a consumer to be able to come onto our, our, our portal and thoroughly enjoy the experience, have ease of being able to find information, have ease around being able to find the properties that, that suit their exact criteria. And from a client perspective, you wanting to know what value is power property getting, what are the, what are the new uh, uh, products, what are the new services, how can you get information, how do you know what your market share is in the area? And that's what we're going to start building. So about halfway through the year, you're going to see a fundamental difference and again, how does that private property interacts in this ecosystem? Um, and then just, we talk around humanizing the digital strategy. So it's really, really awesome to have this end-to-end -end digital experience. But the reality is, is, it's specifically for South Africans, it's cold and it's heartless. We know this. We know that buying a property in this country is highly emotive. We know it's highly complex. And we fully understand that consumers wanting to have a human being there, and that's you guys. And that really is what it is that we're wanting to achieve over the next year or two. It's not about disintermediating real estate. It is about bringing a real estate agent a lot closer. I saw earlier on there was a comment there that spoke around um, I think it was, you know, that a, a buyer shouldn't be able to enter into an agreement or sign an off to purchase without having a bank AIP. That's exactly what it is that we're wanting to be able to do. And that's what our portal is going to start being able to do to you, is to be able to hand a client over to you that has already got approval and principle from EFSA, that we've told you this is what market they're looking at buying in, the exact area, the exact price range, three bathrooms, 2.5 children. And that's the digital strength that we're needing to bring to the fold. And we're thoroughly enjoying um, the starting on this journey. And again, we'll work really, really closely with all of our clients and our partners around how it is that we, we do this that creates efficiencies that we want. I think I'm going to stop it there. Um, there's a couple of slides that I wanted to speak to, but we are running out of time. So I think it's really, really important that we bring Celeste in. I think there'll be time for Q&As. I'll read here on the chats if there are some questions. I see there's a couple. We'll see if we can enter, uh, answer them at the end. I think now's a really good time to bring Celeste onto the stage and let us some, share some of the information that we have around your specific areas. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, in the meantime, if you could look at the chat and uh, I'll bring you on at the end after Celeste. There are a couple of questions that Bridget's asking. There's a few questions that Sharon is saying ditto to. So specifically look at those. And there's another question that Bridget asked, which is, it sounds like we're competing for the same consumer. Perhaps Carl, give, give it some thought. And then after Celeste, I'll bring you back on just to give us your responses. Celeste, looking beautiful as always. Welcome <laughs> to Texas. Thank, Thank you, Trace. Thank you for your time.
Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Cole, um, for that segue into the uh, performance overview for the Garden Route in, in Eastern Cape. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it is so exciting for, for us to be able to reconnect, uh, feeling a little bit isolated out here in, in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit jealous uh, when listening to the uh, fresh uh, rainy weather that some of you are experiencing. We are experiencing tropical heat here in Derbs. Um, but yeah, so so welcome to everyone. I am going to switch my camera off for the duration of my presentation purely because there are some graphs and I want you to be able to see them. But I'll be back, I promise. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so Let's take a look at the sales performance uh, for the Eastern Cape. I have split uh, the, the data up to, to showcase both the Eastern Cape and the Garden Route separately. So bear with me, I will go through the Eastern Cape first and then we'll move over to, to the Garden Route. So what has been happening in the sales performance space in terms of the listings uh, for the Eastern Cape? Year on year, we have seen a steady growth in terms of listing counts. However, results for the period January and February 2021 against the previous uh, years for the same period um, has shown a little bit of a decline in terms of the listing counts. Now, this is not overly concerning for us because it is a trend that we are seeing across the board um, on a national level. Despite this um, decline, um, views and leads have continued to grow. Um, and have improved for the period 2021-2020, uh, that January-February uh, timeframe, uh, by 13 and 2% respectively, which is quite encouraging. Now, when we, we take a look at the rental um, results uh, for the Eastern Cape, um, sorry, next slide, Esty, thank you. Um, we've seen a steady increase Again, if we take a, a, a listen to what uh, you for those for that listing counts. However, um, the leads and views have dropped by 25, uh, 7 and 25 percent respectively, um, which is somewhat indicative of the market. As, his, uh, as you had mentioned earlier, sorry, um, with regards to supply and demand and also um, the various adjustments that have taken place um, in, in the market with COVID and, and the impact of it. Okay, so if we take a look at the where people are looking, where are people searching from a sales or buyer perspective in the Eastern Cape? I think it comes at no surprise that some of the suburbs listed, I know Dion mentioned semigration, semi some of the places listed like Jeffreys Bay and St. Francis are typical destinations in the semigration movement with consumers being able to choose more freely where they do work and life. So interesting information that we've gleaned from this. It would be, if we had more time, I'd love to spend time actually unpacking each of these pockets. Um, but yeah, certainly some information, interesting information. Moving on to the rentals, uh, top searched uh, suburbs in the Eastern Cape. Uh, again, whether you are buying or selling, who wouldn't want to be closer to the ocean and the wide open spaces? Um, and it, it's, again, perfect for the work-life balance. Um, and then if we take a look at the median listing prices from a sales and rentals perspective for the Eastern Cape, we see that the median listing prices for both sales and rentals are tracking below uh, the national average in general, or the national median, sorry, um, we have noted a nominal decline in listing prices year on year. Um, again, in that January, February um, time frame for 2020 against, uh, 2021 against 2020, um, 
with a slight drop of 5% for uh, sales and 20 and 21% and for rentals. Now remember, this is the listing price. So it's not your actual sale price or your actual lease price. It is what the property is listed for. Um, rentals have been most notable, and this could be in response to a low demand for rental properties and um, a right sizing on the part of landlords owed to greater demand to uh, to, for, for the clients to buy and possibly um, in response to the household budgets adjustments from the part of the consumer or the or the tenants. If we take a look now moving on to the garden route, um, we've seen similar to the Eastern Cape, we've seen some growth in terms of views and leads. In fact, um, a substantially better growth in terms of views and leads from, uh, um, from a garden route perspective. Um, even despite a drop of 10% in listing counts um, that we've experienced in, in the beginning of, of, the, of 2021. Despite the drop in listings, you can we can all agree that the 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 response from the consumers in terms of views and needs has been dramatic. Moving on to rentals, uh, much like the rest of the country. Um, the views and leads have dropped. Um, interestingly, the the views for the for the 2021 2020 period of January and February has stayed the same. Um, however, just like the rest of the country, or just like the Eastern Cape, we have seen a drop in um, leads. Looking at the the uh, top searched properties in the Garden Route again. The garden route is no stranger to semigration, and it appears for this region um, it is still growing strong, um, owed to people adjusting to the new way of doing life and business. This is also true for rentals. Um, with the rentals focused more, it looks like on on uh, this on the Central George area, um, and with clients moving more. For, out of the central uh, town area in terms of um, investment for buying. Okay. Right. Then if we have a look at the median listing price, both for, for rentals and sales for the garden route, it is interesting to note that unlike most other parts, the garden route has been tracking above the national average in terms of sales median listing price. We've seen a 6% increase in the, the sales listing price, again, for that period, January, February 2020 against uh, January, February 2021. And we have seen a 19% increase in the rental listing price, um, bringing that, uh, even though Current, even though it's been tracking slightly below the na national average, it's starting to come in line and um, exceeding the national average um, moving into February and March 2021. Thank you, Hesti. Okay. What I just want to express is the 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 information that we've shared with you today is very general for the garden routes and the Eastern Cape. What we would really love is an opportunity to set up some time with you in your area of specialization or if within your specific geography where you specialize. And we would love to unpack the statistics or the data that we have gleaned for your specific area with you. Um, and on behalf of my team and myself, I just want to say a huge thank you to each and every one of you because we would not have been able to achieve these results without your support. So thank you and stay safe. Very, thank you very much, uh, Celeste. Please stay on the stage along with Carl. Uh, Carl, sure. there was two or three questions, maybe sort of in conclusion, some of your thoughts. I know the studio have informed me that other questions have been answered by Johet and Jan 
directly. Um, so we don't have to go back to those very first sets of questions. But, but Carl, while I still have you, perhaps you can just give us a, a response to those two or three questions that were asked in the general chat. Yeah, I'll see here from Bridget. Um, what is Power Property doing in order to have more of the market share? We even come close to our competitor. Sorry, we don't say their name. As their fees are shooting up the roof uh, to also benefit us agents and mark our listings better. So, without giving too much away, we clearly have a strategy, and the first portion of that strategy has been working really, really well. So, besides what Celeste shared there with her graphs, we talk about we're struggling to get 1.2 million consumers onto our portal every month. Only two years ago, we're now doing 3.2. So, some of the strategies that we're doing has, has been really, really effective around some of our SEO and SOE stuff. Another portion that, that was working incredibly well, will be working incredibly well for us is when we launch that platform. And this is really what it's about. It's about choice. Consumers need to choose a brand. And how do they choose a brand? They choose it because it resonates with them. They choose it because it means something to them. They choose it because it makes everything that they need is, is answered. And, and that's what we are providing. A way of an example, we have almost 700,000 people on our social media pages. Now, that is staggeringly big, big compared to any one of our competitors. And we use that really, really well to start promoting um, the information and the knowledge that we have. Another example, we, um, we do uh, we, we put properties onto our Facebook page and we'll, we'll randomly choose a whole bunch of properties to do it by area. We essentially, every time we do that, we're getting 15, on average 15,000 um, impressions for just a little Facebook ad. We did a show house the other day with, one of, with our own chat, where 500,000 people watch that video. Now, that talks to how it is that we show for the consumer, so the, consu the consumer chooses private property. There's a whole bunch of other strategies which I, I can't make public, but it really is around making sure that the consumer makes the right of the choice and that's to, to be with us. I Thank didn't you so see much. Anything else. No, that's it, Cole. I think that's that's enough from from our side. I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for being here. So I'm going to let you get in the limo, both Carl and Celeste. Maybe you guys can uh, share the ride home. <laughs> Split the so thank, you thank you. Wow, bye -bye. Awesome. Thank you, Celeste. Bye -bye. Thank you, Carl. Bye -bye. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. We have absolutely come to the end of our show today or of our conversation today. Huge thank you to APSA Bank and Payprop for sharing their knowledge with us. Especially thank you to Jan for those comments right at the end there. I'm sure many of you may have been listening with half an ear, but when he spoke about those sections, you must have, you know, your ears must have propped up. Um, because, wow, what, what great insights. Remember, you can get your 1.5, one and a half non-verifiable CPD points from AISA. Follow the link that is being pasted in the chat right now. And um, I think maybe if I can just hear from you guys whether you've enjoyed your time with us today, just in the chat, can you drop a thumbs up or a well done or a thank you or a a green heart, which would even be better, then I know we've done our work today. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. At the start, I did say that we are going to acknowledge the most, uh, the best question and the person who have actually um, engaged with us the most. So we now have um, the best question. I'm going to give that prize to Marilyn Phyllis. Marilyn. Thank you for that question. Um, our team will reach out to you between Ben and Trish and the rest of the private property marketing team will reach out to you, Marilyn, and we will give you your prize. And then the person who engaged, absolutely engaged the most, how amazing is technology? Like we can tell immediately who's been the most engaged. And the person who's been most engaged and asked literally the most questions and dropped the most hearts is Anna Marie, but it's Anna Marie that, that without her surname. So there's an Anna Marie Janse van Fieden, and then there's an Anna Marie without the surname. Can you please stay on the line and have a chat with Ben? And then Ben will be able to let you. Yes, Anna Marie, that is you. We got you there. 
All right, everyone, I just wanted to say thank you again to our partners, PayProp. Thank you so much to our partners, APSA, and the teams that have connected from all across the country, all across the world. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we have a weekly newsletter that we send out to the industry where we share property news and trends, tips and tricks, as well as important business updates and initiatives from private property. We also share popular articles from our Agent Connect Facebook page, and we ask you to then repost and share on your own networks. Drop us a green heart in the comments if you're subscribed to the newsletter. If you're not, don't worry. Ben will drop the link in there and you're able to then subscribe to the newsletter. The session for today, this morning session is now over. We're not going to close the event yet. If you if you look next to the live button, you'll see event is ending in 11 minutes. What we'll do is we'll keep the event open for the next 11 minutes. And guys, please have a chat with each other, discuss some of those insights, and hopefully we'll see you again very, very soon. All right, that's that's a wrap from me. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks to the studio, your head and everyone else. I wish you a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Feline. Thank you, everyone. Bye.